Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness.
this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Cause through it all, God's been good. Times replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears But I felt his arms around me As I faced my greatest fears You see, I've had more gains than losses And I've known more joy than hurt As his grace rolled down upon me Undeserved For God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell you everything He is. But the best way that I can say it Well, hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this worship hour at Roebuck Baptist Church. It is good to see you. I'm thankful that you're here. I'm glad to be here. We're looking forward to how God's going to work in our midst this morning. And I just really appreciate you. I don't think I have a microphone, so I can just get louder and louder and louder. Sorry. But we're glad you're here. And I'm going to begin by uh, leading us in prayer and uh, as we begin our worships. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the privilege of being able to gather freely and worship you, uh, proclaim your gospel, sing your truth, uh, pray together, fellowship together. We are so blessed. And I thank you for every single person who's here this morning. It's not an accident that any of us is here. In fact, this is probably the only time this side of eternity that just this group well, it'll be the only time even in eternity that just this group that's here this morning will be together. It's unbelievable how you work. And so we're going to count on you to work through what's done this morning through the praying, the singing, the proclamation of the, of the gospel, the reading of scripture, all that's done, that you might be honored, that you might be glorified. So, Father, we just thank you. We commit this time to you now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. 
John chapter 3 it says see how very much our father loves us for he calls us his children and that is what we are but the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him I hope you have a relationship with God today you can be sitting in this room and we think that everybody here believes in God everybody understands everybody has faith that's probably not true and if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ you don't have a relationship with God you can do that today because I know in my life that I have a good good father who truly cares about me and when I mess up he makes me right and when I'm sick he heals me he loves me and he loves you too
awesome. So can y'all believe y'all only got five weeks of school left? And that's it. Like, that's it. <laughs> it was like laughing. That's crazy to think that's how little is left. But um, a little thought. Uh, you've been going to these classes for a year now. You only have five weeks left, 25 days. Two of them are half days, I think. And you're probably going to skip two or three. So you don't have that many days left to be with those kids, your friends that are in your classroom. Next year, they won't, they won't be the same ones in your class. So here's a thought for you. I want to challenge you to pray, to think about one student, one friend, one person in your classroom, and specifically pray for them the rest of this school year and just see what God does with that. And that's a challenge for all of us. I know you're going to work every day, and uh, you don't know how long you'll be at that job. I never know how long I'm going to be at my job. Be, pick one person at your office that you can be praying for. Like, I got this guy named Tim, and woo, so I've been praying for him. Um, but that is my challenge for y'all. You got five weeks. Pray for someone specifically at your office or at your school for the next five weeks, all right? So let's pray together right now. Father, what a joy and a privilege it is that we're allowed to come and bend a knee and pray and lift up our hearts to you. Because, Lord, you are um, your God, your king, your ruler of all. And this week reading in Romans, Romans 4, I'm reminded it said that, God, that you are the God. You're so big, God, that you can create things out of nothing. And you bring life to things that are dead. And like the song we just listened to, we're, we're alive because you're alive. Because of Christ Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I just pray this morning as we get a chance to be in this beautiful room and, and sit here and worship and hear songs and, and, and in just a minute see your word open up and read and, and hear your word preach, God, I just pray that you'll continue to expand our hearts and our minds as we have the joy of just worshiping the one true almighty God, and that's you. Be with us this morning. May we, may we humbly worship you. And Lord, I do pray that you would just help us to continue to grow in compassion towards the people that you've placed in our life, whether it's at school or whether it's at work. You know, Lord, we go past people day in and day out and always to a point where it, it becomes where we don't even see them anymore. But Lord, I pray this week you will open up our hearts and our minds and help us to have compassion for those people and to pray for specific people you lay on our hearts. Lord, we love you and help us continue to worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, let's stretch our legs one more time and stand and read God's word together. And Tim's continuing his sermon through the Sermon on the Mount. And we're in Matthew 6, and it says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor... Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But ye, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Whenever you fast, do not put on gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearances so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. You know, sometimes life brings us incredible highs. And we ride that crest just as long and as high as we can. But then there's other times in life that we're just so thankful for the plateau. It's just smooth, 
We just coast right along. And there comes a time in life, and I'm sure most of you already know this, that a low will come along. Sometimes it's not just a valley. It's just a pit you don't know that you'll ever get out of. That's been our year this year. But we're so very thankful for family, church friends, bosses, co-workers, and even some family and friends, some friends that we were just beginning to know who have just sheltered us with an amazing love, been very gracious, and an, an outpouring that almost like one of those highs. The thing is, as wonderful and as gracious as you guys have been to us, the thing that's really brought us through it along with all of that is the simple fact that through it all, God's been good. Lately I've been looking back along life's winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. There's just no better way to tell you than to say. God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could, for through it all, God. Good. And I can see I've cried some bitter tears, but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. I more highs than losses. And I've known more joy than hurt As His grace flowed down on me I deserve For God's been good In my life I feel so blessed Beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning. And his love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is. But the best way that I can say it is simply this God's been good. feel so blessed beyond my wild strings when I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, wouldn't change them if I could. Through it all, every step of the way, God's been
going to have prayer for you and Tammy. I'm not going to ask her to come up here, but I just want to have prayer for you. I thank you so much. What a good brother. Danny and I are about the same age. <laughs> You're older. <laughs> As I said, Danny and I are about the same age. And he and Tammy and their family have been a, a big part of our church and our family. And we love you guys. I just want to have prayer with you. Could I do that? Father, I thank you for Danny and Tammy and their family. And I thank you for the reminder that you've given to all of us this morning through this song that you are always good. We don't always understand. There's so much we don't understand. And I know the Grices have been through something really hard that I'm sure they're still struggling with. But I'm so thankful for Danny to be able to stand up here and just testify before you and all of us that you're always good. And so we thank you for that. I pray your blessing on Danny, on Tammy, on their family. And that you would just help us all to always remember that you're with us through the good and the bad. And you have been good and you always were and you always will be. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Love you, buddy. I'm not much older than him, just a little bit. All right. Well, are you a religious person? Are you religious? We talk a lot about religion. What does it mean to be religious? Well, most people would say being religious is, means to be devoted to God, some kind of a God, to worship that God. Yeah, that's right. That's being religious. But there's another aspect of religion that just means adherence to anything, really. I read an article about a guy who's very religious. And I want to tell you, this is his testimony. This is what he said. He's a very religious golfer. And he said, I've played golf every weekend for 20 years. 20 years straight. And then he said this. For some of you old Baptists, you may remember this line. He said, I never missed a Sunday. That's being religious. Because one of the definitions of religious is scrupulously and confidentially faithful at anything. You could be religious to your, about your job, about your hobbies, about your lifestyle. It just, whatever it is, the, thing you, the things you enjoy, you can be religious about those things because those are the things that you do constantly. And many times you do them, you don't even do them consciously. It's just part of who you are. That's what being religious means in general. And there are all kinds of faith religions. Um, in the world, there's Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, all kind of New Age religions, all kind of Eastern religions. Christianity, of course, still the largest religion in the world. In fact, I read that there are estimated now almost or over 4,300 different faith religions in the world. And some of you are sitting there, okay, I got them. I got Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. No, no, no. Those are not religions. Those are denominations. And this is the great thing about denominations. All those people you just mentioned, and we could keep going, Catholics, Episcopalians, whatever, whatever, they're all part of what we call Christianity. In fact, I mentioned there are 430, I'm sorry, 4,300 different religions in the world. There are over 450 thousand different Christian denominations in the world. And the largest, fastest growing group of Christians in the world are not part of any denomination. They're, what, they're what's called independents. In fact, uh, the second edition of uh, the World Christian Encyclopedia said that independents have become the second largest category of Christian adherents following Roman Catholics and displacing practicing Protestants. So there's this vast group worldwide, and it's just growing and growing and growing. And you ask them, well, what's your affiliation? What's your denomination? And there is none. Well, what do you believe? Well, we just believe the Bible. Well, everybody says they believe the Bible. Anyway, the bottom line is, there are many, many people that are religiously devoted to a faith but there are also many, many people, and I would say pretty much every one of us, is religiously devoted to something. So religion is something that the Bible addresses, and in the passage that Chuck just read for us, Jesus addresses the issue of 
religion of those who are supposed to be following him, following God. And he talks about three particular things. And he's basically issuing this as a warning about how not to practice religion. And so I've entitled this message, Is Your Religion Showing? Because the, the bottom line thesis of the sermon is this, God doesn't want you to show off. He wants you to show your religion. He doesn't want you to show it off to bring attention to yourself. So let's look at the passage again and consider three things. First of all, is your religion showing in the way that you give? I want you to notice the first word in the passage is the word beware. So Jesus starts us off with a warning. Beware. Now when Jesus gives a warning, it's very significant. It's important. Uh, a friend of mine from many years ago when we were in seminary, the minister of music at our church, Warren Pearson, told a story one night at church about driving in a rainstorm in the dark. And visibility was terrible. The rain's just pouring, and it's dark, and he's on an unfamiliar road, and he's just trying his best to keep it in the road and to get home safely. And all of a sudden, the voice mechanism on his car starts going, your wiper fluid is low. Your wiper fluid is low. Your wiper fluid is low. And obviously the irony is, he didn't need any wiper fluid. <laughs> he just needed to get home safely. Now, what if the message had come across to him that said, your brake fluid is low. Your brake fluid is low. Well, that would have gotten his attention. And that's what I want to say about what Jesus says. When Jesus gives a warning, it's not a frivolous warning. He's not warning us about the lack of wiper fluid in the middle of a thunderstorm. He's warning us about things that we need to avoid because they are serious. He never gave frivolous warnings. So what are we to be aware of? He says, be aware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Notice, he doesn't say beware of practicing your religion or practicing your righteousness. And he doesn't even say beware of practicing your righteousness before men. He says beware of doing those things just to gain attention to yourself. Just to be noticed. To make people think, wow, look at Johnny. He is a great religious guy. He goes to church every week and all these kind of things. The question here is one of motivation. And I want to talk about motivation for a minute because motivation is so important. What motivates your faith? What, for instance, let's just, let's just, just bring it real down easy. Why are you here this morning? I'm not going to ask you to stand up and answer, but just think about that. Why are you here this morning? What motivated you to come? Some of you, maybe your parents made you, right? How many of your parents made you? Oh, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Great. Did you raise your hand? No. Some of you, your wife made you. Um, some of you because you work for the church and you have to come because this is part of your job, Chuck, whatever. Yeah, we got whatever motivations we have, but here's the thing, and I think this is important. Uh, Haddon Robinson, I quote him sometimes, this great preacher and preaching professor said this. He said, as far as I know, there's nothing in the scripture that says that anything is right if the motivation is wrong. Just because you do what might be considered right if the motivation for it is wrong, it's not really a right act. It's not an act of righteousness. Jesus says, don't do this because if you do, you'll have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Three other times in the passage, He says, once you do these things, that's your reward. You, that's the whole reward. And the word there for reward is a, is a word like our word for receipt. And so what Jesus is saying, yeah, if you get up and you, you show off your prayer life, Standing on the corner preaching, standing up in church preach, or praying so that everybody can be impressed with your praying. Great. That's it. That's your reward. That's all you get. It's like some of you guys will be going to college soon and some of you went to college or seminary, Bible college, whatever, and you have chapel. And sometimes they make it mandatory. In other words, you have to go to chapel. And then after you go to chapel, you have to check it off. I went to chapel. You have to go a certain number of times in a semester or you, you, you lose points on a grade, you get a grade for it. And so that's all, that's all you get. If, you just, if you're just demonstrating your prayer life to be noticed by people in public, it's like getting a receipt or just putting a check mark by, I attended chapel, I did it, I did my thing. That's all you get. And then he says, when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets 
that they may be honored by men, same thing. They, get their, they have their reward in full. Interesting word, hypocrite. We all know what a hypocrite is. A, a hypocrite is somebody who's, who says one thing and does another or whatever. Literally, it comes from the Greek and it means actor. And it's fascinating in the New Testament. I, had, I, had, I didn't research this carefully enough. In one place, I saw that it was found 17 times. Another place, 18 times. Maybe a difference in translations. But every time the word hypocrite is used... In the New Testament, it's on the lips of Jesus. He's the one that he... Many people say this is one of the greatest things that he gave. Chuck Swindoll said, uh, Jesus exposed hypocrisy more vehemently than any other vice. A major reason he delivered the Sermon on the Mount was because of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. The unashamed hypocrisy. Because they were, they were great at this, as we talked about last week. They were per outward religion. That was all about... That's what they are all about. They were checking all the boxes. And the people noticed that if that's all you're doing it for, if you're just doing it to get that kind of attention, that's your reward. That's all you get. So Jesus said, don't do it that way. He said, do what you do in, to, when you give to the poor. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So you, that your giving will be in secret. And then he says, and your Father who sees what is done in secret. Let me make sure you understand this. What you do in secret, I may never know. What you do in secret, no one may ever know but you. But you need to remember this. God sees everything. He knows everything you do in secret. And when He sees us doing what pleases Him with the right motivation, loving for, loving, for loving Him and loving others, He's going to bless that. That's the promise. It says, when He sees what is done in secret, He will reward you for what you've done. Well, the question then is important to ask. Is it, is it wrong for us to expect blessings when we do things for the Lord? It's not wrong to expect blessings, but it's wrong to presume blessings. It's wrong to define those blessings. It's wrong to demand those blessings. And by the way, what is the greatest blessing that you receive when you give? What is the greatest blessing you, you, you receive when you serve? What is the greatest blessing that comes out of you being what God wants you to be? Well, the greatest blessing, I would say, is this. Someone else is ministered to. A need is met. And I think about how, how, blessed, how blessed we are to have the opportunity to, to be a blessing to someone else, to meet someone else's need. And so the first question that I have to ask you about your, the showiness of your religion is this. Is your religion showing inappropriately in the way you give? He goes on then, and we'll, we'll take the second. Is it showing in the way you pray? Verses 5 and 6. He says, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. By the way, I mentioned hypocrite found 17 or 18 times in the Gospels. It's found three, it's found three times in this passage. He says, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the streets. So they may be seen by men. Truly I say, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And again, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Is your religion showing in the way you pray? What is prayer? What is prayer? There are a lot of ways to answer that. But I think one of the best ways to answer it is this. Prayer is basically fellowship with God. Our men's group reading James Packer's book, Knowing God. He says prayer is about getting to know God. This week I had the privilege of representing the whole state of South Carolina, the South Carolina Baptist Convention at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And we elected a new president. Pray for Dr. David Dockery, who is now the new, the 10th president in the 115 years of Southwestern Seminary. And Dr. Dockery got up and talked about some things related to online learning versus on-campus learning, and this is something I don't need to go into, but he mentioned a verse that I often quote and talk to you all about. It's Mark 3.14. In Mark 3.14, it says, Jesus called the twelve, his disciples, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now, normally, we, we would jump right past that part that says that he called them to be with him, and it's just that he called them so he could send them out to preach. Yeah, but the first thing he wanted was he wanted to be with them. They spent most of them, at least two years, maybe more than that, uh, maybe some up to three. But the, the purpose was not just so that they would go out to preach. Yes, they did that, and they were great at it. 
They turn the world upside down, it says in Acts. But the first thing he says, he called them to himself that they might be with him, that they might spend time with him, that they might learn life with him, that they might see how he lived and learn from him how they should live. And so there's a dynamic there that must not be missed. And so when we go to the Lord in prayer, it's not just to ask Him for things we need. It's to recognize that we're meeting the the very God of the universe. We're coming into contact like the song we sang and the song Danny sang. He's a good, good Father. He's our Father. That's what Jesus taught. We'll get to the Lord's Prayer next week. He taught us to pray our Father who is in heaven. And so the biggest purpose of prayer is developing a deep relationship with God. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God, said prayer as a relationship is probably your best indication about the health of your relationship with the Father. He said if your prayer life has been slack, your love relationship with God is probably floundering. And that's convicting. You think about your own personal relationship with God right now. How is it? I mean... You're his child. If you've given your life to Jesus, there's nothing can ever change that. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. But how's, your, how's the depth of that relationship? How's your fellowship with the Father? Are you on speaking terms? Does he know your heart? I mean, no, he's, he does know your heart. But have you made sure that you're communicating what's on your heart to God? That's how we get to know him. That's how we grow. So, yes, that's so important. So, Jesus didn't forbid public prayer. We do public prayer here all the time. I've already done that this morning a couple times. Chuck has done it. We'll do it again. He didn't forbid it. But he criticized people for praying publicly simply because as as an effort to impress others. He said, if you do that, that's it. That's that's your reward. It's, It's over. That's your receipt. That's your ticket. That's your check mark. That's all you get. So Jesus stressed the need for personal, private prayer. So the most important place to pray is not here. It's not. It's not in the, simple, uh, the temple. It's not in the synagogue. It's not on the street corners. It's fine to pray in all those places. It's important to pray in all those places. It's important for us to pray as a group. As a church, it's a blessing to get to do that. But we need to do what Jesus said. We need to go into a quiet place, a, seclu- a secluded place. He says, go into your inner room. The King James says, your closet But they didn't have closets in those days, so that was a a British attempt 400 years ago to kind of give this the gist of this. But it does give the gist. To go into a private room, close the door, turn the television off, turn your phone off, and spend time in the presence of God. And somebody said, we have to close the door so we can keep the devil out. Well, I think it's more like this. We need to close the door so we can keep the distractions out. I don't know, maybe the distractions and the devil, maybe they're one and the same. I'm not sure. But it's important for us to take time to do that. Now, I know that's not easy. People are busy. And by the way, I'll just put out a little thing here. I've never been a mother. But I think about moms who have small children. Many of you are like that. Or maybe grandparents and your kids have uh, small children. Man, those people are busy people. It's demanding to take care of a kid. Or two. Or three. Or Four. It's this demanding. I'm, I'm not telling you what you don't know. And so the, we get an example here from Ruth Bell Graham, the, the, the wife of Billy Graham and the mother of five children herself. And she, ta- she wrote about this and talked about praying on the hoof. Now those are her words. What does she mean by that? She meant, I've got so much to do taking care of my kids while my husband's out saving the world that I just pray when I can. As I go into the bedrooms and clean up the rooms of this child or that child, I pray for that child, I pray for this child. And that's important to do. We need to learn to do that. We need to practice that. And that needs to be part of who we are. You can pray anytime. And so that's a good example. In fact, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, we're to pray without ceasing. We're to have an attitude of prayer all the time. That should be our default response. Whenever something happens, let's pray. Let's pray. Just pray. And you don't have to pray like anybody else prays. You just pray. Talk to God. He already knows. Show Him that you want Him to know, that you want to be connected as best you can. But the idea is this. If we have an attitude of prayer, it's going to require that when we can, and for those of you who are not as busy, you can. Take time. Get alone with God. Forget everything else. 
And just focus on Him. Use your Bible as a, somebody, I don't know what to pray. Use the Psalms. Pray the Word of God back to Him. Just spend time in His presence. And Jesus says if you do that, He'll, he'll reward you openly. I love the fact that Jesus did this. I mean, it's a crazy world, isn't it? A lot of things going on that are crazy. I got up this morning and saw some things that just blew my mind before I came to church. But it's so important in the midst of a crazy world to just get alone with God. Jesus did that in, in Luke 5. It says he would often slip off to the wilderness to pray. One of my favorite stories is from Mark 1. I got to go to Capernaum this year when I was on the trip to Israel. That was the hometown. That was, that's, that was Peter's hometown. That's basically where Jesus made his headquarters. And it tells about one very intense night that he's at the home of Peter's mother-in-law in a, or his home, and she has a fever, and he heals her, and then she's ministering to them, and it says people were coming to him and bringing people who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and it said it was so crowded that it uses what I would call, Dallas, I hope this is appropriate, acceptable hyperbole. The whole city had gathered at the door. I don't necessarily think that means that every single person was there, but it seemed like it, and maybe people from other places. It was just jam-packed. And so Jesus is involved, it's intense, he's, he's teaching, he's healing, he's casting out demons, he's just, ama it's an amazing time of ministry, and I can just imagine how drained he would have been, and I would have said, you know what Jesus, you can go ahead and sleep in, in the morning, when, when it's time we'll get you up. But you know what it says in the next verse, Mark 1.35, early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got out, he got up, and departed to a lonely place, to pray. This is Jesus Christ. This is the Son of God who was in perfect fellowship with the Father all the time. And it had this incredibly intense night of ministry. And what does he do in the morning? He gets up early before anybody else. The reason I know is before he rises, says when the disciples got up, they couldn't find him. They all slept in. He got up. They slept in. And of course, when they found him, Peter said, everyone's looking for you. Which is one of my favorite little eisegetical moments. I believe there's more in that than just what they said. I believe everybody is looking for Jesus. I hope you find Him. The Living Bible gives the essence of this passage when it says, go away by yourself all alone and shut the door behind you. Find your closet. You may not have a closet at your house. You, may, you know, I've, 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 I've done been in situations before, maybe it's so busy, I've, I've gone out to my car with my Bible and spent time alone with the Lord. You say, man, you're weird. No, I, well, I am, but that's not why I'm weird. That's just an example. I'm trying to, be, I'm trying to respect other people's uh, space as well. Maybe there's a place. I used to walk when we lived in Lakeland, Florida. I'd walk to Florida Southern College looking out over Lake Hollingsworth, and there was this, this, the buildings were designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and they were kind of weird, but they had these little alcoves and things. And there was this place where I could get up underneath, look at the lake. Nobody was there. I wasn't bothering anybody. I was by myself, and I could spend time alone with God. So prayer is not a means to show off your faith, but it's a means of developing your fellowship with God. So, in your prayer life, is your religion showing in an appropriate way? Finally, is your religion showing in the way you sacrifice? And I'd like to skip this part of the, to the, of the passage because I'm going to talk about fasting. And you probably could guess that I'm not an expert on fasting. And, uh, but um, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, I'll just start with this. Sacrifice, if you do Twitter... I'll, I'll, I guarantee this, sacrifice is not trending on Twitter. Sacrifice is never going to trend on Twitter. We don't like to talk about sacrifice. We don't want, listen, we're Americans. We think we deserve everything, including three meals a day or four meals a day or whatever the case. Sacrifice is something that we don't do very well. But I want you to see here, Jesus didn't say, if you fast. He said, but when you fast. And you could make the argument that he never, fully, he never fully commanded fasting, but he certainly affirmed it. So I want to ask the question, well, what is fasting? And as I've expressed, not being an expert on fasting, basically fasting is just doing, doing without something, specifically food, but it could be other things. And I'll quote David Mathis, who grew up here in Spartanburg, and his book on uh, Habits of Grace, he said, Fasting is an exceptional measure 
designed to channel and express our desire for God and our holy discontent in a fallen world. And I love this. Please listen. Fasting is a desperate measure for desperate times among those who know themselves desperate for God. A desperate measure for desperate times for people who are desperate for God. And you know what? I don't fast. Most of us don't fast. Because why? We'd rather just complain about everything. But these are times that I would suggest could be desperate for us, and you and I could be desperate for God, and it might be a time for you to say, you know what? It would be good for me to sacrifice something, maybe even a meal. You know, we call our first meal of the day breakfast. You see the word fast and break, break fast? It's amazing, isn't it? We went eight whole hours without eating. And so we get up, and the first thing we do is we're going to eat. You know, Cheerios or oatmeal or whatever you eat. We break the fast from the night. We had to go all night without eating. What a great sacrifice. Well, like prayer, fasting um, at its root is a reminder of something. And this is a quote from uh, a writer. He said this, prayer and fasting are both reminders of this. God can take care of it. God can take care of every need we have. So you need food. Now, by the way, I need to throw in a disclaimer here. Some of you think, I can't fast. My medical condition, my health won't allow me to fast. I understand that. God understands that. I'm not saying you should. And I'm not saying anyone should if you have questions about that. But you could do something. You could fast in some way. Jan Justice says he doesn't do Diet Cokes. He's given that money to the church to the Kingdom Investment Strategy. You told the whole church, so I'm just repeating. He's our chairman of deacons. He's setting the pace for us. So, listen, I can, I can sacrifice all my Diet Cokes. So I don't drink Diet Coke. But the bottom line is, what would it mean for you to really sacrifice something so that you might grow in depth in your relationship with God? Chuck Swindoll gives three examples, three uh, applications of how fasting can help us. First of all, it can help us to have a more intense fellowship with God. Again, instead of having your... your your meal time, every meal, maybe take a, a day or a couple days and just skip a meal and just go by yourself and be alone with God and just focus on Him, fellowship with Him. Second thing, he says, fasting helps us develop self-control. And it does. And that's the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 9. He, uh, Solomon talks about it in Proverbs 25. Um, as we learn to, to eat less, as we learn to do without, we experience growth and self-control. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, to the inlands of China, growing up or as a, as a young adult as he was preparing for China, he decided that he, one of the things he would do was he would eat nothing but just the bare basics. Even though he could have afforded more than that, living in, in England at the time, he decided, I'm going to prepare myself for hardship. So he trained himself so that when he went to China, he'd be uh, more able to take care of the work God had given him. And then the third good reason for fasting, and there are probably many, many others, is to share with others. One of the things you could do, Jan has suggested he would just sacrifice that weekday uh, Diet Coke so that he could give extra money to our Kingdom Investment Strategy. Or you could fast and give the money that you would have spent on your meal to help somebody else who's hungry. There are all kinds of examples of how fasting can help you to grow in your relationship with God. And so again, um, we need to recognize the point here. There's one more part of this, and I love this. This is from somebody named Jeremy Taylor who is an ancient man of faith. Um, and it was quoted by Oswald Chambers. And he said something interesting. We've already talked about hypocrisy. He said, here for once, Jesus taught his disciples to be hypocrites. You say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Because he's, he's condemned hypocrisy through the whole thing. And now he's telling them to be hy hypocrites. Well, here's why. He says, when you fast, wash your face. Put on a, put on a good face. Don't, don't make everybody recognize, oh, he looks so horrible. He's, he's in dust and ashes. He's got that gloomy face. He must be spiritual. He must be fasting. Jesus essentially said, don't do that. Instead, wash your face. Dress up. Smile. You don't have to tell everybody you're fasting. In fact, that's the opposite of what you need to do. You just need to do it and let God bless how He chooses to bless. So, Jesus' point is fast in secret, keep smiling, and be willing to sacrifice. 
as you grow in your relationship with God. So is your religion showing in those three ways? In the way that you give, the way that you pray, the way that you sacrifice? It's a good question for us to always ask. As somebody who's probably a, a good Bible student might be sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, Pastor, just a couple weeks ago, you read this other verse from Jesus from chapter 5 where he said, let your light shine among men in such a way that they may see your good works. And now he says, don't do these things in public because you don't want them to see. You want it to be private. How does, that doesn't seem like, it seems like a contradiction. Well, it's not a contradiction because I love what one writer said, A.B. Bruce, uh, the long departed saint, said this, we're to do both. We are to let our light shine when that's appropriate, and we're to do these other things in secret when that's appropriate. He put it this way, we are to show when we're tempted to hide, and we're to hide when we're tempted to show. In other words, when we're living in the world on Monday at, at school tomorrow, guys, and you go to school, there's going to be a temptation for you to want to join in with the crowd. You don't want them to, to think you're weird or stupid or anything, and so the tendency is going to be, well, I'm just going to keep, kind of keep my Christianity to myself. And they're not going to see a witness from you because of that. But then there are going to be other times when you're going to want to maybe do the opposite. And you start pumping up your, your faith and, and your witness or your, your religion. In other words, to make sure they know. I've heard kids, I've heard people, many various ways in my life, I've heard people argue about who's more religious. And I'm sitting there thinking about the people, and I know them, and I'm thinking none of you guys go to church. None of you guys ever express any faith. And they'll argue about who's more religious. So just remember that little adage, show when you're tempted to hide, that's, that's Matthew 5, 16, and hide when you're tempted to show. Now sometimes people will say something like this, now I don't want to be any trouble, oh, no I'm sorry, now I don't want you to go to any trouble. That may not be a phrase you hear a lot, but we've heard, you've all, if you're my age or anywhere near it, Danny and I have heard this all our lives, me apparently for a little longer than him, but if somebody says to you now, I don't want you to go in any trouble, that's their way of saying, just, you know, if you'll just kind of let me, you know, hang out, you don't, please don't do anything beyond that. But you know, Jesus doesn't say that here. In fact, he's saying the opposite of that. When he says, beware, that could be translated, be careful, take pains, take heed. In other words, Jesus is saying this to all of us. I do want you to go to some trouble to avoid this. I want you to beware of practicing your righteousness in front of other people just to be noticed by them. I want you to think about that. I want you to be careful about that. Listen, in our culture, in our cultures where we, we gather as Christians to try to you know, prove how right we are about everything, we've got to be real careful that we're not saying to the world, hey, look at us, we are super saints and you're super sinners and you need to be like us. Doesn't seem like that would be a very good way to, to bring people in. And so the, the thing we do need to say is, yes, let's be careful. Let's be careful in doing this in a way that honors God. Ask ourselves, why do we give? Why do we pray? Why do we sacrifice? A successful actor is someone who, and you've been, maybe you've been to a show or a movie or whatever, and you've gone away and you've said, wow, that guy was really good. That actress was really good. Boy, that person, I've, you know, Ryan Al, sometimes we'll see a movie and we'll say, wow, that guy who played that role was really good in that role. So that actor is doing what he or she is doing to try to please the audience, to try to impress them, to try to gain accolades, to try to make people think, wow, whatever that, that person's in, I want to go see that person again. Well, um, when we, when we perform our activities and do the things that we do as Christians, we are trying to please an audience. We're trying to please a different audience. It's an audience of one. Because God is all the time, everybody's looking at the outward stuff. Remember uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7? We're all looking at the outward stuff. Man, this guy goes to church. He's a deacon. He, uh, he gives. He's kind. This, that, and that, all those things. But they're doing it, the, 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 it comes across as if they're doing it for their own uh, affirmation, for their own uh, grabbing attention for themselves. But that's not our audience. Your audience is not the person you're trying to help. Your audience is not anyone out there. Your audience is Him. And so as we think about if our religion is showing, our relationship with God is showing, our performance is showing, 
we just need to remember this. Man looks at the, at the outward appearance. He always does. God looks at the heart. One of the most important things to me came out in our meeting this week as trustees at Southwestern Seminary that Dr. Dockery, who was nominated and then elected by the board to be our president, every person, and I don't know Dr. Dockery well, but the little encounters I've had with him, and of course I've read, he's written books that I've read and studied stuff that I've read, that he's written for many years. But everyone who talked about him this week at the meeting said almost the same thing. He's a great scholar, he's a great leader, and he has, he's a man of integrity, and he's humble. And everybody said something similar to that. And, and the little bit I know of him, that's what I would have said. And I want to tell you something, that's what God looks for. He looks for the humble heart, the person who's not trying to impress. Dr. Dockery has never tried to impress anybody on the board of trustees at Southwestern. He's been on the faculty there for a while. He's just been the man that God's called him to be, doing what God's called him to do. And he got a great reward and in, in, in trust from us when we elected him past, this past Wednesday to be our next president. But it's just a reminder, when God looks at you right now, what's he see? He sees what's in your heart. He sees what's in your heart. He's not interested in how flowery your language is when you pray. He's not interested in the amount of money you give. He's not interested in how disciplined you are in sacrificing for uh, the, uh, the benefit of others. He's interested in what's in your heart. That's where your religion really needs to show. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today for this reminder. It's a challenging passage. It's a challenge passage on several fronts, including the fact that as we go through life, we are religious people. We do things religiously. And even in our faith, we practice these things, and they're important. You want us to give. You want us to pray. You want us to sacrifice. All those things are important. But, Father, as we do those things and help us to do them, as we do them, Father, I pray, as I do them, I pray, you would help me, you would help us to do them in a way that honors you. That it's not about men's approval. It's about the smile of God. It's about your smile. It's about your approval. And we're not trying to earn our salvation. We can't. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It's an absolute gift from you. It's all grace from you. But we do these things because of our love for you. Because as you've loved us and brought us into your fold, you've shown us the need to love you and to love others. And so help us to do these things with that heart, with that motivation for your glory. And it's my prayer that that would be true for me, for all of us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our time of invitation and response. And if you need to come for any reason this morning, I'll be here at the front to receive you. Let's stand together as we sing.
I'm Deacon of the Week, Glenn Padgett. My wife is Laura Padgett. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day to come worship you. And thank you for the message you give Tim to bring us this morning. Pray, Lord, that as people look at me or us, that they wouldn't see religious people or religion, but that they'd see Christians. And I pray, Lord, that those people would, if they don't know you, want to know you because of us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. 